Hello everyone, and thank you for attending my talk today. My name is Sarah Barger, and I'm a research geneticist for the U.S. Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station. Today, I'll be speaking about a large-scale Forb Common Garden study that I'm leading for the Great Basin Native Plant Project. I started working in the Great Basin in 2008, and even in the relatively short period of time that I've been working in the Great Basin, it has become clear that disturbances are increasing in frequency and size. Here, I'm showing fire perimeters across the last 20 years as an example of one type of disturbance that is adversely affecting native plant communities. Over time, these disturbances add up, causing resource managers to wonder how to restore native plant communities in these areas of disturbance. The research I'm presenting today will get us one step closer to answering this question as it relates to the evaluation and selection of appropriate plant materials, which is the second step in the native plant materials development process. Common garden studies are a method for understanding how plant populations vary in performance across the range of a species. Prior work from our group has primarily focused on perennial grasses, and this was a great place to start because these native grasses are good for adding structural diversity to native plant communities, they take up space to prevent invasion, they have no or low seed dormancy, and they are livestock safe forage. But unfortunately, grasses alone do not make a functioning plant community. So the Great Basin Native Plant Project has turned its efforts more toward working with forbs. And in 2019, we began the adventure of installing a large scale forb common garden study. This will allow us to take knowledge and resources from past experiments and use them to create a standardized protocol that will streamline common garden research for a variety of forbs. And this is with the goal of determining species level flexibility to being moved into novel conditions, identifying population level variation and performance across the range of a species, and creating knowledge and tools for practitioners who are planning and performing restoration on the ground. The foundation for this study began with the selection of focal species with particular characteristics of interest. These included having a broad geographic range and known importance as resources for wildlife, as well as being easy to identify for novice botanists, and found in reasonably large populations so that seed collection would not adversely affect those populations. We also preferred species with a perennial life history strategy and species with an existing body of research, which would allow us to easily implement them in seed increase and restoration efforts. We selected a suite of three species that include Macaranthera canescens, Canactus douglasii, and Crepus acuminata. Seed collection took place in 2018, and we relied heavily on our project partners to enable seed collection from across the geographic range of these species. Seed collections included between 1,000 and 5,000 seeds from populations that were greater than 10 miles apart or with greater than 1,000 feet difference in elevation. The map on the right shows the distribution of these populations across the western U.S. This giant effort allowed us to install between 43 and 112 populations of each of these species within our common garden framework. In order to ensure that we would be able to measure plant performance in the field, the seeds were grown out at a greenhouse facility and planted as plugs into the gardens. But even at early life history stages that we observed in the greenhouse, it was apparent that there were morphological differences between plant populations. Here, we're showing Macaranthera canescens on the right and Canactus douglasii on the left, with each row representing a different population. And you can see that there are differences in the shape and color of leaves from plants coming from different populations. While the plants were growing in the greenhouse, we performed site selection. This required us to speak to many individuals to find the locations of existing exclosures, as well as to investigate other potential areas of interest for installation of the common gardens. On the right, we're showing a principal components analysis based on environmental data, as well as a map showing the geographic locations of the garden locations that were eventually selected. We specifically selected sites that represent a gradient in environmental characteristics related to moisture and temperature. Garden installation was truly an undertaking and required conversations with lots of researchers and resource managers who helped us to select the best materials and methods for installing the gardens. Now that we've settled on a method, we're working on creating a standardized protocol that we can share with others doing similar work. And just as an aside, I didn't know what a chainsaw auger was prior to this project, but it is really the perfect tool for digging 2,000 holes in a relatively reasonable amount of time. 
Another step of this project was deciding which traits we were going to measure for the garden plants. We did this by combing through the literature to help us select a suite of traits related to the fitness and performance of the plants, as well as those that are associated with local adaptation. We selected a suite of relevant traits that include fitness measures like seed weight and inflorescence number, a variety of phenophase measures, and morphological characteristics related to performance. We are still in the process of collecting data at these gardens. In this slide, I'm presenting preliminary results related to the average rosette diameter of Macaranthera canescens. The main question in this figure is whether plants whose area of origin was environmentally similar to a particular garden would experience higher performance in that garden. In this figure, the blue bars represent plants that came from a seed collection site that was environmentally similar to Glass Butte. The orange bars represent plants that came from a seed collection site that was environmentally similar to Oravada, and the gray bars represent plants that came from a seed collection site that was environmentally similar to Reno. On the x-axis, you see the different garden sites where these plants were measured, and on the y-axis is the rosette diameter in millimeters. This figure shows that plants that came from a site that was environmentally similar to a particular garden grew larger in that garden, meaning they had a larger rosette diameter, perhaps indicating some level of higher performance. My other question is whether plants that come from a seed collection location that is geographically close to a particular garden would perform better in that garden. In the figure on the right, the orange bars represent plants that came from a seed collection site that is close to Oravada, and the gray bars represent plants that came from a seed collection site that is close to Reno. On the x-axis, you see the different garden sites where these plants were measured, and on the y-axis is the rosette diameter in millimeters. This graph shows that plants that came from a seed collection site close to a particular garden had a larger rosette diameter in that garden, perhaps indicating higher performance. It's information like this that we will be putting into our models to help us create seed transfer guidance for land managers. Leaf tissue was also collected for genetic analysis, which will help us to understand whether ploidy may be an issue that we need to consider when making our recommendations, as well as allowing us to couple lineage data with climate and performance metrics. This data will be used to create seed transfer guidance for restoration, which will include spatially explicit seed zones, such as those created for blue bunch wheatgrass depicted here on the right from a publication by St. Clair et al as well as scientific publications produced by the Rocky Mountain Research Station and our academic partners at the University of Nevada, Reno and Utah State University in Logan, as well as other partners that may have yet to join us. In my next slide, I'll be showing you preliminary results for a project being conducted by one of our academic partners at the University of Nevada, Reno. Tessa Bartz and Beth Ledger at the University of Nevada, Reno are exploring how water availability and precipitation at the environment of origin affects seedling emergence and survival. To get at this question, they are performing a field experiment using seeds from populations found in the common gardens and have applied different watering treatments to mimic a range of precipitation values found at the seed collection sites from these populations. In the figure, the x-axis lists the different Canactus populations in order from driest environment of origin on the left to wettest environment of origin on the right. Preliminary results suggest that populations originating from locations with less annual precipitation may have relatively higher survival in the dry ambient treatment when compared with populations that originate from locations with higher annual precipitation. This indicates that precipitation may be an especially important component to consider when selecting seed source populations for restoration. Tessa and Beth are also examining whether different populations of these focal species vary in how they respond to competition with cheatgrass, an invasive annual grass found across the western U.S. It's really important to acknowledge that this work would not have been possible without a lot of help from our project partners. We received a bulk of our funding from the Bureau of Land Management, as well as receiving funding from the Forest Service and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We also benefited from help with seed collection from the Seeds of Success program and the Chicago Botanic Garden, as well as other partners. And the seedlings were treated with care by the folks at the Forest Service Moscow Greenhouse and the Forest Service Lucky Peak Nursery, as well as helpful resources provided by so many others. In addition, we had four gardens on Bureau of Land Management land, three gardens on Forest Service land, 
and one garden on academic property at the University of Nevada, Reno. We also received help with monitoring from the Nature Conservancy, Utah State University, and the University of Nevada, Reno. Some good news is that we have been adding species to the common gardens. Last fall in 2020, we installed 39 populations of Erigeron pumilus into six gardens, and in the fall of 2021, we will be adding Balsamoriza sagittata and Facilia hastata. Currently, these plants are being grown out for installation into the gardens. In the future, we're hoping to work with Lomatia multifidum and Penstemon speciosus in order to add some taxonomic diversity to our suite of species. I'd like to close this talk by thanking the many organizations that contributed to the success of this project, as well as acknowledging all of the technicians that contributed to the hard work of garden installation and monitoring. And finally, I'd like to thank you for attending my talk. I will be attending the live question and answer session, but I also want to encourage people to reach out to me at my email address listed on this slide. Thank you and enjoy our conference.